I, I, I said that you were saying that uh, this uh, your right hand possess is talking about um, like uh, immigrants, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in that video, he was saying that no, it's not that because uh, that's Muhajirun. What do you think about that? Because that video you were making, uh, it made more sense for me than what uh, Brother Khalid was saying. No, I mean for me, uh, for me, it just it it makes sense in in sense of that, just because they are referred to as Muhajirat, Muhajirat, well that doesn't. That isn't disqualifying them from disqualify them from you know from being categorized as uh, refugees, mm -hmm. you know, or or, or 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 categorizing them as Mamalakat Ayman, you know, uh, because when I look at the term, and I go into details also in that video, by the way, uh, in terms of what the word means, uh, what it can be a reference to, I give the different. Uh, possible understandings of it. Now he 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 sees it as meaning that uh, those sorts of people uh, whom you own, okay, and 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 uh, and I do, you know, I do understand that why he, you know, renders it as such, because the word malakat can mean own. Yeah, I understand. Uh, yeah, Malakat. I don't mean that. But for me, I don't uh, particularly see it as such. Now, um, there is a verse in Surah An Nisa, uh, which I came to uh, recently, and, and uh, I was, uh, when, when I was researching <clears throat> for that video. And uh, for example, where Allah says, Walladina aqadat aymanukum. Now, uh, here you have aqadat aymanukum and there we have malakat aymanukum so we have both words aymanukum they're the same and then we have aqadat and we have malakat uh, so if someone for example were to ask me who are the malakat ayman I would say well the malakat ayman are they alladina aqadat aymanukum? They are those people. Aqadat means to make something binding. Okay. So I would say that the malakat ayman are those whom your ayman have made binding. So the, 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 they're the ones whom you have taken an oath to take charge of. So when I take an oath that I'm going to take charge and care of this particular thing or person, then that becomes that ma malakat yamini. Okay, that is what my hand or what my oath has taken charge of. So uh, whether I use hand or oath, and I also explain in the video that uh, it was because the right hand was the one that people used to use. You, people would use to give, you know, because the hand, right hand is seen as, you know, the, the hand of trust, the hand of strength, you know, that kind of, the, 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 you know, the hand of honor and all that. That's why it is associated with good, even within the Quran, when you have Ashabul Yamin, you know, the companions of the right hand, you know, those are considered the good guys. Whereas the companions of the left are considered the bad ones. So good is always associated with the right hand. So when I use the word, when I see that as mamalakat ayman, it has to be associated with something good, with something that is trustworthy, with something that has to do with honor, with something in that sense. Right? And of course, it also has something to do with power and authority. Definitely. Um, so when I read throughout the Quran, uh, when it is talking about the Mamalakat Ayman, it and uh, it is talking about those particular women, or those but not just women, but those particular people who have not been documented within society. 
And by documented here, I mean is that of course that there were the, that it included def and I also say that in the video, it definitely included slaves because slaves were a part of the society. They were there. So saying that they didn't exist is just that's not true. And saying that it included them, <clears throat> it had people from Wharton regions, okay, who came from war uh, terrible places you know, which had been uh, torn down, which had been broken down because of war, due to war. Uh, it included <clears throat> captives, you know, war captives, not just, uh, of course, a slave didn't necessarily have to be a war captive, but uh, it also included war captives. It could also have included prisoners of war, okay? That all those different groups of people were included in Malakat Ayman. But then you have a, you have a, the verses in particular with the Quran when it is talking about a, who you can marry, right? That we can clearly understand that what those verses are referring to is talking about these particular women who have been sorry they have like a a less position within within society and not, not a less position in terms of that you are discriminating discriminating against them but because they they have had a hard life so they have gone through hardships throughout their lives and hence why for example the punishment for them is half that of those who were documented so this is how i see it as that the mamalakat ayman were the group of people who were considered undocumented by documented, I mean that those people who were recognized by the government and they were under the care of the government or they were under the care of the society. They were fortified by the society. Whereas the Malakat Ayman, they were undocumented. And so when Allah talks about marriage in that, in that chapter, in chapter 4, he talks about فَإِذَا أُحْسِنَّ فَإِنْ أَتَيْنَ بِفَاحِشَةٍ مُبَيْنَ So if they become documented literally if they become fortified okay so in like for example in and i use that in, to to make it easier for people to digest it in in today's terms so i use the word documented you know like we have today when you have someone who is documented it means that that person is within the system that person exists is, or is within the system they're protected by the system but when i have someone who is undocumented that means that that person does not have papers it means that that person doesn't have legal status legal standing within the society like for example if you go to america or you go to even here in denmark you know when you people who don't have for example people who cross the border right in America particularly, they cross the border and they come to America, they're trying to find a good life and they live there illegally. They're undocumented, they're considered undocumented. They're undocumented, meaning that they don't have rights to the system as other people. Those particular people are what I would refer to as, if we are taking it back to that time, would be Mamalakat Ayman. Okay, they are undocumented within the society, meaning that the system has not recognized, uh, uh, they're not as recognized within the system as other people. And so uh, in order to make it simpler, you know, for people to understand, I use analogies like that. So when I say, for example, uh, that if you have like a resident and a uh, a citizen that they don't have the same rights. I use those as examples in order for us to understand what actually was going on back then. I don't think that uh, what we assume, you know, that was prevalent at the time, that, that those stuff might have been go going on and most certainly they did go on. But I just deny the argument that the Quran is talking is, is that that's what it's referring to. I'm not saying that some people assume that when I say that 
the Quran doesn't endorse slavery. That means that means that Muslims didn't practice it after, or that several didn't didn't exist. Like some, I was I was having a discussion with someone, and I said, "No, the Prophet Muhammad could not have had slaves." And then someone asked, "What are you talking about? Are you saying that? Uh, what are you talking about? Slaves have existed for thousands of years." As if I was actually say, making the same point. They are assuming that when I deny the Prophet Muhammad having a, had slaves, that's the same as me saying that slaves didn't exist. No, I do understand that they did. Okay. I also understand that they were there at the time of the Prophet. I just deny the argument that the Quran asks people to own slaves or to possess them or to have them. Okay, the only verses, and I also mentioned that in the video, the only verses in the Quran where the word slave is used in connection with the mu'minin, okay, is in two places. One place is in Surah Al-Baqarah, where it talks about that uh, marry, that uh, uh, do not marry, right? do not marry the idolaters man, Okay, until they come to the faith, because a a a, a, a faithful um, abd is better, right? Or a faithful a male slave is better than a mushrik, or a faithful female slave is better than a female mushrik. So here, Allah is encouraging marrying the slaves, marrying off the slaves and marrying the slaves. And then the, that's the one place where it is there in connection with the, with the mu'minin. Another place where it is there in connection with the mu'minin is in Surah An-Nur, where Allah says that وَلْيَسْتَعْفِفِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ نِكَاحًا حَتَّى يُغْنِيَهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ uh, or, or, or where it says Wala right? where it's talking about all these different uh, these different verses about uh, the the Malakat Ayman, right? And it says that uh, um, it says and marry off the single ones, those ones who are single, or the unmarried, those ones who are single, I am Amin Kum, the single ones among you, was Salihina among you, and the righteous ones, Min Ibadikum, from among your slaves, your male slaves, Wa Imaikum, and your female slaves. So here again, we have Allah saying, when it is used in connection with the Mu'minin, Allah is saying to marry them off. So my question was in the video, and that's what I wanted to show. Why is Allah telling the Mu'minin, as well as the Prophet and everyone else, to marry off the Mu'minin? Why, what, what, what's the point that in the two times when he talks about the, the, the Ibad in relation to the mu'minin, it's about marrying them off. Why? And that is why I brought in the verse in Surah Al-Nisa. It's because when, the, the, when, since I told you that the mamalakat can include slaves, it's because when the mamalakat, the, the, the mamalakat marry, they all of a sudden get this new status. Okay? They, are no, they, they get this new status. And they are now they now become documented within society, and those are the only two times. Look at the look at again how the Quran talks about in terms of the Prophet, right? Allah tells the Prophet that uh, uh, you are no longer la yahillu lakan nisa u baadu min baadu. Sorry, la yahillu lakan nisa u min baad. Right? Allah tells the Prophet, women are no longer halal for you. And this is talking about, of course, other women, you know. Uh, except the malakat. 
So accept what your right-handed oaths have taken charge of, except those ones whom you owe or what your hands have taken charge of or what your oaths have taken charge of, except your mamalakat. So the prophet was forbidden from other women to marry unless those women were from the mamalakat iman. So I asked why? Like, why is it that he's not allowed to marry from the free women but he's allowed to marry from the mamalakat. What's the point? What's the purpose? And it goes back to the verse in Surah An-Nisa. Because Allah wants the, 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 these women and, the, and wants the mamalakat ayman to receive this new status. And a way in which people would, which in a way in which they would receive this new status would be what? Marriage. Now, if the prophet, the prophet himself, marries from the Mamalakat Ayman. That is an encouragement also to other people to see him as an example and also marry from the Mamalakat Ayman. The intent here is that at one point, this would die out. At one point, if everybody's doing it, at one point, this thing, this division, that there would no longer be a mamalakat. And that's the point. That at one point, there would no longer be mamalakat iman anymore. So Allah tells the prophet to not to stop from marrying other women and only marry from the mamalakat iman. Why? It's because it was a necessity. The prophet had to be the example of this you know he had to marry those ones whom people consider to be of lower status and the people would emulate that example and they too would marry the mamala the mamalakat ayman and thereby grant the mamalakat ayman the same rights as they so the prophet was allowed to continuously marry the mamalakat iman. And so were the mu'minin. See, in the surah Nisa, which the verse which people take to mean, it's talking about a polygamy that you can marry up to four, right? Even they say that the mamalakat iman, there is no restriction on that. You see? <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So, if there is no restriction on the on the uh, on the mamalakat ayman, what is the point? It can't be for sexual reasons. That doesn't make any sense. You know, why 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 is it? I mean, if it's for sexual reasons, why not uh, allow them to just be with free women? If it's just for sexual reasons. Why make this distinction, right? So for me, that's the point, is that the Quran had set out this system and it was expecting that by the time when the prophet is dead, you know, by that time, all the, the, the mamalakat ayman, you know, all, the slavery would be, would sort of like be removed, not just in, not just in around in the prophet's community, but everywhere where they went, right? That the prophet was supposed to be the example of that. He marries the mamala kataiman. The other mu'minin, they also follow suit in that example. When they do marry the mamala kataiman, the mamala kataiman become muhsanat, muhsin, muhsanat. They are no longer right just from the mamalakat iman now they are muhsanat and then their children that they, they are no they don't grow up into slavery and all that kind of stuff in a lower status they grow up as new you are creating a new system a new community a new nation a new environment but unfortunately is that what happened no and i think that this is one of the greatest disappointments of the Muslim history. So it's, it is the greatest failure 
of the Muslim, because this is what the prophet set out. This is what he was trying to do. If I was, if I was really trying to uh, portray a world which in which uh, slaves, the, the, sorry, in which has this discrimination between free and slave and, and, and that kind of system. If that was my intent, I would, the Quran would be filled with verses pertaining to slaves and free people. There would be laws of inheritance pertaining to slaves and free people. There would be foods pertaining to slaves and free people. Money, slaves and free people. Marriage, slaves and free people. And all that kind of stuff. All the different laws would be divided that way throughout the Quran. But that's not the way the Quran does it. There are no inheritance laws, for example, for the Mamalaka Taiman. There's nothing absolutely silent. Which, which again leads me to, to say that no, the Quran was not trying to endorse that. If, the, if my intent was to endorse freeing, you know, if it was to endorse um, slavery in that sense, I would not include verses that talk about freeing of slaves, talk about, and, and by the way, you notice that every single time in the Quran, where there is expiation, kafara, uh, where it happens, it always happens that you are doing something for somebody else. Okay? Notice that in the Quran. It's very important, actually. That when you have the kafaras that happens, that are in the Quran, so like, for example, you kill someone accidentally, right? You have to make restitution for that. You have to pay restitution. You have to, there's blood money and there's other things involved. Or when you break an oath, there's restitution for that as well. When you, uh, when you refer to your wife as the back of your mother, there's also restitution for that as well. And you notice that in all these kafaras, it's an act that is done for somebody else. Okay? Which means a good act a good act that is done for somebody else. Then the Quran tells you, okay, if you cannot find the means, then you either fast, you know, then that becomes yourself. Now you're doing something that is about you. Fasting, that's about you. It's not doing any good for anybody else. That is only provided as if you don't have the other means. But you notice that all the kafaras are about doing good for others. That's how you make something, you know, you make, you correct a behavior. You correct a wrong, you know. You don't correct a wrong by, you don't punch someone and then go pray, you know. That, that, <laughs> that doesn't make sense, okay. You have to do something for either that person or other people. That's the kafara, the system of the kafara. And if you can't do that, then you do something that is about you, like fasting or praying, you know, something that benefits you, basically, you know. So anyway, uh, with, within the Quran, and you have this idea of setting free of slaves, and staying, I would not classify it as a bad, as a, as a steep thing, as something difficult within society. If my intent was to make, was to endorse slavery or to see it as something good, I would not call it as a difficult path. I wouldn't put it in the same category as what? As feeding the poor. I wouldn't call it as a sign of birr, of righteousness, of virtue. I wouldn't put it in the same category of a faridha, as Allah tells us in the Quran, obligatory act within Surah uh, At-Tawbah. I wouldn't do all these things, you know, if I was endorsing it. When Allah says in the Quran, okay, to tell the Prophet, 
قل هل انبئكم بشر من ذلكم tell them uh, should i inform you tell the prophet tell them should i inform you of what is worse than that you know so basically people were uh, the prophet was was telling them should i inform you of something worse as an end result with allah the worst thing that can happen to you in this world of or, or maybe not the worst but what is worse that can happen to you in this world okay that is what allah, allah tells the prophet to tell the people should i tell you of something worse to happen something that can happen to you in this world then it tells malanahu allah it is the one whom allah has cursed wa ja'ala minhum alqiradata wal khanazir and has made some of them pigs and monkeys okay qiradata wal khanazir wa abada tagut and he has made them enslaved to a taghut ulaika sharrun makana that is a worse position that is a worse position to be in to be enslaved allah calls that a worse position so the idea that allah here is endorsing slavery or arguing for it or saying that it's okay for muslims to have slaves or or, or to have slave women or to no I, i i i cannot see that at all being the case within the text of the quran even for me personally if i were to leave islam okay that is the one part that i could not accept that even if i were to leave islam the one part that i would not accept to be true even if i were to leave islam and that's certain about it is a this brother. what is slavery 